exercise, but just give everyone about 30 seconds to start joining in and then we'll begin. Okay, thank you, Tim. Let's begin. Okay. Welcome to all of you. Um, we've got a fantastic team and welcome to all the audience who are joining us um, and also on YouTube and through Research for TV and any other place. Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a, a superb panel, it's my honor to introduce them. Um, and um, I'd basically like to welcome Professor Jürgen Beck from Freiburg who is one of the world's authorities really in this field of spontaneous intracranial hypertension and his team uh, who have previously given one of the best webinars that we've had uh, in April 21 and on this very subject. Um, I'd also like to welcome Christian, Christian Fong from Freiburg, who is also one of the authorities in this field and will be introducing the subject. We're very grateful, Christian. Uh, and uh, Nicholas, who is one of the outstanding radiologists in this field and will be setting the scene about diagnostic radiology and imaging. Um, furthermore, Thomas will be speaking to us from an interventional radiology perspective and we'll be really, really keen to uh, hear that and on um, this specialist field and a uh, huge thank you to Thomas. So I'd like to welcome everyone and to also remind um, everyone that there is um, uh, in addition to a center of excellence in Freiburg, they are honoring us today a meeting which is happening on the 30th of March until 1st of April this year. And um, all those who are interested in the subject um, uh, are most welcome. And there's already a superb team um, uh, giving a series of talks and uh, engaging in consultations. Um, so please do join the team in Freiburg uh, on the 30th of March and uh, the meeting uh, running until 1st of April. Um, and um, yeah, um, also for the audience, please do put your questions in the question section and then um, I'll hand over it to the team and um, welcome again to everyone. Perhaps we can start with Christian, if that's okay. Thank you. Well, dear Matsuo, uh, I hope you can see my slides. Not just yet. Um, you want to, now we can see something. Okay, now, sorry, now you can see my slides. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for your very uh, kind introduction. And uh, dear colleagues, I'm happy to be uh, part of the second webinar on spontaneous endocrine hypertension. And uh, my role today on fundamentals and basic management is really short. I'd like to give you a really short overview about what is actually spontaneous endocrine hypertension, what causes this, and uh, how often does it occur. And I think nowadays spontaneous nuclear hypertension is known to most of you uh, as um, a couple of years ago when well, few people knew about the disease and were eager to treat these patients. Um, what causes spontaneous nuclear hypertension? Basically, it's very easy. It's a loss of CSF at the level of the spine. And this excessive loss of CSF at the level of the spine causes this downward displacement of the nervous structures within the bony skull of the patients and therefore causing all the symptoms related to the upright position and these autostatic symptoms. Namely, most of the time, of course, patients present with autostatic headache, which is the key symptoms of the disease, but the patients also present and very often complain like brain fog, and they say it's like being underwater, it's like pulled into one own selves and they very often display uh, vestibular cochlear symptoms. And although this might seem mild to you, you may not forget that few patients um, also present with a decreased level of consciousness and fall into coma, and very, very few uh, might even die of the disease. So when talking about SRH, we need to classify and define the disease. 
And now days everyone refers to the definition of the international classification of headache disorder. And this definition demands uh, on the autostatic headache, of course, and uh, the low opening pressure of CSF or evidence of CSF leaking on imaging. And you've seen already that I've shaded this opening pressure uh, in gray. And this is a very important point because we know nowadays that about 60% of patients that have a proven SAH don't have a reduced opening pressure. Meaning if you have a low opening pressure, well, it's nice, you can define the disease. If you don't have a low opening pressure, this does not exclude the disease. And this is a very important point. Like I said before, uh, SAH is caused by a loss of CSF at the level of the spine. And nowadays, most of the time, the literature differentiates three types of leaks. Namely, it's a type one leak. It's a classical ventral CSF leak caused by a bony spur, which cuts the dura like a knife. And there you have the CSF loss and CSF regress. Uh, the second type of leak, type two, is the lateral CSF leak, which is actually a tear in the thickal sac on the lateral aspect mostly at the level of the exiting nerve root and therefore causing here the CSF drainage. And a more uh, formally uh, well-discovered entity is the type three leak, namely the direct CSF venous fistula, where the CSF is immediately drained into a periodicular vein uh, without being uh, lost through the extra dual space. This is an image from an uh, intraoperative uh, view that I'd like to show you. This is a type one leak. You can see here the uh, minimal uh, invasive approach and it's a transdural approach. You can see here the opening of the dura at the dorsolateral aspect and then the transdural approach and view to the ventrally located CSF leak, type one leak with the bony spur which cuts the dura like a knife. Um, this image is also intuitively showing a lateral CSF leak. It's again a minimal basic approach into lamina. And you can see here a tear in the dura on the lateral aspect, and as well um, like a cyst extruding, probably subarachnoid membrane, and losing CSF here. And the last type of the leak that I'd like to present you, type 3 leak, is the direct CSF venous fistula. And uh, just as an example, you can see here the contrast media, which is pulled uh, while the patient is in the lateral decubitus position. And you can see here an early draining vein, um, draining CSF and contrast media, which proves the direct CSF venous fistula. So we have three types of uh, CSF leaks, type one, type two, type three, the ventral, the lateral, and the direct CSF venous fistula. Um, Taking this into consideration, although spontaneous intracranial hypertension has all the symptoms that start at the level of the head, basically you can say it's a spinal disease because the problem's origin is at the level of the spine. And nowadays you can even go one step further. You also have to say it's also vascular disease because taking into consideration type three leaks, this makes the disease also like a vascular entity. When you talk about SAH, you need to talk about uh, incidences as well. Um, formerly, before the introduction of the MRI, this was a rarity and there were only small uh, single reports about the disease. But of course, with the introduction of MRI and more sophisticated diagnostic workup, the incidence grew bigger. And the latest publication I found was from 2022, again from Dr. Schieving uh, from LA, stating the incidence of 3.7 per 100,000 and females are more often affected than male with 4.3 compared to 3.7 100,000. Um, in general, nowadays, SAH is considered an important cause for new onset daily and persistent headaches that must be examined further. Although most of the patients, of course, primarily present with a headache as primary symptoms, you must not forget that it's, it's a dangerous disease. And as soon as you see those pictures, with contrast media and meningeal enhancement and uh, probably suture collections, you have to consider SAH in the differential diagnostic workup and differential diagnosis because nowadays there are more and more reports about very uh, dangerous causes of the disease with patients falling into coma, patients presenting with uh, cerebral venous thrombosis and even die of the disease. So you must not forget SAH in the differential diagnosis when you see the suspicious. MRI images and thereby I'm already at the end of my presentation. I'd like to draw your attention to our meeting. Mansour said it already, 
uh, at the end of March here in Freiburg, and I would be happy to um, see some of uh, the colleagues in person here in Freiburg. And then I hand over to Niklas. Thank you. Um, Christian, that was um, a superb introduction, <laughs> um, especially of the seminal points. And there's some, a couple of quick questions, if I may. And I, of course, welcome Jurgen, who is truly one of the world's experts on this, and the rest of the team to make comments. What do you think? of the diagnostic criteria? Do you think we've got that right already do, do, around the world, basically, or certainly in the European community and maybe in America, in terms of how do you make the diagnosis? I think um, with the um, orthostatic symptoms, it's also a critical point because uh, depending on the time point when the patients present to your office, uh, the orthostatic symptoms are gone and these patients uh, present like a, very blurry uh, symptom, um, uh, uh, yeah, collection, and the autostatic nature is not there anymore. So you have to uh, really consider this and consider this new diagnostic workup. Everything else, I think the most important thing is that you prove a leak at the level of the spine. And this is, is dependent on your uh, capability at your uh, uh, treating hospital, what kind of diagnostic uh, workup you can offer and have also experience with. But the proof, uh, the proven uh, leak at the level of the spine is the most important thing. So thank you for that, especially that last comment. And Jürgen, do you have anything to add? To, to that? I, can, I can only underscore what Christian has said. It's not restricted to headache. It may also be symptoms, um, double vision or brain fog or dizziness or tinnitus. Mm -hmm. And it's not restricted to orthostasis. Uh, both symptoms are mainly there in the beginning, orthostatic and headache, and then over the course of the disease, it may subside into non-headache and non-orthostatic symptoms. I can only underscore what Christian has said. Thank you. So along the same lines, in, in terms of one of the photographs that you showed, Christian, regarding the lateral leak. Now, if you see a, a cyst or a small pocket of CSF, um, the obvious thing to sort of ask or question is, well, that's confined leak. And, you know, how much leak do you need outside the subarachnoid, you know, in outside the subarachnoid space in terms of volume of CSF that is going in and out of the intradural um, compartment? Um, do you see what I mean? It, it, is, there a, is there any understanding of the critical volume that moves from one posture to the other. Uh, and I hinted this regarding your excellent paper that you know you don't even need to have a leak, you could just have dural laxity. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, and I know this may be a difficult question uh, and I don't expect a, a, an easy answer at all or, or an answer either, but is there a, a volume that is exchanged on change of posture that, that we, you can anticipate or talk to us about? Um, well, actually, I think we cannot quantify uh, the volume. Uh, it's, I think, for my part, the ventral CSF leak, they have more capability of uh, a larger volume leak than most of the lateral leaks, uh, to my experience, when I see them surgically intraoperatively, inter because very often lateral leaks, they are, see, they are more confined. Sometimes you see a CSF oozing out on, on myelography, sometimes you don't. But the ventral CSF leak, there's a larger hole for my part. These are the, the, the high flow leaks, while the lateral ones are more the, the lower flow volume leaks, basically. Jürgen, if you want to comment. Mm -hmm. um, another excellent question. And I think for the classic standard type of leak, it's rather a high volume leak. As you will see in Niklas' presentation, you see during diagnostic tests, you see the contrast column really oozing out of the thecal sac, and you see in lateral CSF venous fistulas, you see it, it is filled like a vessel. So it's several milliliters that emerge during a couple of seconds during the diagnostic shot. But still, this does not mean that you always, in all cases, you need to have such a high flow fistula. There are more subtle cases as you are referring to the laxity of the dura, and there are more probably on and off situations, whereas a, a valve kind, mechan uh, a mechanism like a valve that opens and closes. But in, let's say for the standard leak, it's 
rather detectable and rather high flow, several milliliters. Thank you for that, gentlemen. Maybe it is to do more so also as you're hinting at that the rapidity with which the volume moves and the drop in pressure. But thank you, that's, that's excellent. Um, I've got lots of questions and I'm sure there's, there's more coming, but maybe can I just, uh, um, we go to the, our next speaker, who I think is Nicholas, is that right? Yes, thank so, you. Welcome, thank you very much, Nicholas. Please proceed, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna start the presentation. Just a second. Okay, can you all see the presentation? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm going to talk about basic imaging of brain and spine in SIH patients. And I've got two topics. First of all, routine MRI and imaging signs. And this first part is all about the questions are there any signs uh, on MRI for SIH? Um, and this is not about uh, the uh, exact site of leakage. First, we want to look, have a look at the um, signs on M, uh, MRI. So um, this is what Christian already says. It is a spinal disease. We have a loss of CSF at the spinal level. And what exactly happens in the head? Um, there's uh, not enough uh, CSF in the head. And so the head is sinking. And therefore, it pulls at the dura. Uh, it may produce um, fluid collections in the subdural space or um, produces subdural hematomas. We can see uh, brain sagging. Uh, we may see uh, tonsil herniation. And there is something like a vacuum phenomenon that evolves so that we can see uh, an enlarged pituitary gland and we may see enlarged sinuses, sinuses. Um, and we use the uh, nowadays established so-called burn SIH score. And this was developed by the SIH group of burn with uh, Thomas Dobroki. And this is a nine point scale. And it is a tool to assess the probability for an uh, underlying SIH. And I would like to show you how we measure it uh, step by step. We have the uh, supracellar cistern. And when you have four millimeters or less, we give two points. We have the prepontine cistern. Um, less than five millimeters is given with one point. We have the mamillopontine distance. Less than 6.5 millimeters is given with one point. Sometimes we can see enlarged, engorged uh, venous sinuses. Um, then we can give two points. Sometimes we see uh, pachymeningeal enhancement given with two points. And you may see um, subdural fluid collection. This is given with one point. And all in all, <clears throat> when we have um, zero to two points, there's a low probability for SIH. Three and four points is immediate and five and more points um, is given with a high probability for SIH. What else can we see on MRI imaging of the head? There is not only a, a hygroma or subdural um, hematoma, we can sometimes see um, space occupying acute bilateral uh, subdural hematomas in these patients. In this patient, we have a um, clearly brain sagging, but not only that, we have a tonsil herniation. This might be dangerous as Christian has uh, already told you, um, it may produce uh, an entrapment in the foramen magnum and this might be life threatening, but it is not very often. And here's a special sequence. You can see artifacts in the cerebellum and this reflects um, products of blood. This is called superficial siderosis. And we may see this in patients with a very long ongoing disease. 
usually 10 years or more of SIH. And these patients may present with uh, hearing loss or ataxia. So what is important for the MRI protocol of the head? I think most important is a T1 sequence with contrast enhancement. And we use a very thin uh, sequence, uh, one millimeter, so we can reconstruct it in, in every direction. And here you can perfectly see the enhancement of the pecaminingeals, and uh, you can measure all these uh, important distances uh, for the uh, SIH score. And another important sequence is a coronal T2 sequence. In this case, it is a flare suppressing the uh, signal of the CSF. And here we can perfectly see uh, subdual fluid collections and hematomas. MRI protocol for the spine. Um, we use um, uh, coronal T2 two-dimensional sequences. It's just good uh, to see, for example, diverticular or fluid collections at a glance, but uh, this is not totally necessary. I think most important for the spine is the so-called heavily T2 sequences. They are fat saturated, and that means we can only see the um, signal of the water. And this is most important for us because we want to see extra dual fluid collections. Here's a bony spur, and next to it, there's a fluid collection. These are very special sequences. We use them uh, in less than one millimeter thickness, and it takes us 18 minutes. I think you can manage with 13, 14 minutes when you use one millimeter. But they are most important, and I think it's really a big step forward to use them in, in the diagnostics for SIH. Um, and I have some examples. When we have a look at the spinal MRA, it's, it's always the question, is there any extra dual fluid collection reflecting an underlying uh, dural tear? And here we have an actual view and we can see um, this uh, fluid collection and um, we can perfectly see the dura to distinguish it from the um, intrathecal CSF, the same patient in the sedative view. And here is the dura again, and this is the longitudinal fluid collection. This is another patient with a extra dual fluid collection surrounding the spine. And here as well, you can perfectly see the dura all around. So these images are very high, uh, have very high spatial resolution. This is another patient uh, where there's only a minimal amount of um, extra dual fluid collection. But without a doubt, this patient as well has an underlying dural tear. So um, what about contrast enhanced MR myelography? So this technique needs a lumbar puncture and uh, we have to inject a contrast in intrathecally. And we used these techniques um, in the past, but there's a good study about it uh, that, report, that reports that heavy T2 MRI images, as I just shown, are as sensitive as um, enhanced MRI myelography. So we think this uh, technique is no more necessary to see an extra dual fluid collection. Um, and this is the same about the contrast enhanced CT myelography in supine position. There's another work reporting the same heavily T2 MRI is as sensitive as contrast enhanced CT myelography. So we can reduce invasiveness, we can reduce radiation dose, we can uh, re reduce uh, several investigations. When you have these good uh, heavily T2 images, it, it is no more necessary. What other signs are there on uh, MRI of the spine? Here's a disc herniation at the level T6-7. 
And uh, next to it, we can see uh, um, a fluid collection, but disc herniations are not, not specific for SIH. A lot of people have disc herniations. We performed a myelography and prone position in this patient, and the dural tear was not at the level of the big disc herniation, but one level below. And that was only, only a very tiny bony spur here. So do not rely on the biggest herniated discs or bony spurs. What about nerve root diverticular? They are not specific as well. They may be associated with CSF venous fistulas and they may be an indication for a lateral leak, but in the end, not specific. Here's an interesting pitfall, a patient uh, that has distinct uh, symptoms of SIH, but in the MRI of the head, this is unremarkable. The SIH score accounts for, there's no, uh, for, for zero. And when we have a look at the spinal imaging, we can see clearly a um, extra dual fluid collection. So this patient has SIH, but no signs in the head. Spinal signs are superior to those in the head. In conclusion, um, we, um, we say that it is important to use MRI of the head and the spine because the signs in the head may decrease over the curse of the disease. Um, please use a contrast agent for the MRI of the head. It's important. We recommend to use uh, the nowadays uh, established burn SIH score. And I think it's really important to invest in good MRIs of the spine, especially the heavily T2 images. Please ask your radiologist or neuroradiologist to implement them. And when you have these, you can waive other techniques like MR myelography or CT myelography to, found, to find an extra dual fluid collection. Okay, this was the first part. The next part is all about the question, where exactly is the site of leak? And therefore we need uh, myelography techniques. Uh, as Christian already said, uh, you can divide three types um, in SIH patients. And I think it's really helpful to use a certain terminology to understand these three types. Um, if you um, use the SIH score and you have five or more points, this, patient's, this patient have a, a high probability for SIH and we call it then this patient is, posit is head positive for SIH. If this patient has a so-called spinal longitudinal extra dual CSF collection, at the level of the spine, we say this patient is slack positive. Type one leak is the most common leak and uh, it accounts for, I think, 50 or 60% of SIH patients. Um, the, uh, most patients have an underlying uh, uh, bony spur and that cuts the dural like a knife and the CSF is running out in the extra dual uh, space. So these patients have or are SLAC positive on MR, MRI. Here's an example, um, a digital subtraction myelography patient is in prone position and you see a um, double line of contrast and exactly at this point there is the dural tear. And this patient has an uh, underlying bony spur, what you can see in this, in this axial uh, CT scan. And this is now the dynamic scan. This is um, a digital subtraction myelography. Patient is placed in prone position in the angiography suit. The table is tilted so that the contrast can run towards the head. And here you can see something like a contrast jet and the contrast is running out in the extra dual space even faster than intrathecally, which means there's really a big, uh, um, a big uh, leak. 
we sometimes have problems to find a, a ventral leak at the um, upper thoracic level. And the reason is <clears throat> that there's too much uh, too much mass mess in this region. Um, we have uh, the bones, we have the shoulder, and we have an attenu attenuation of the contrast. And it's mostly it's not possible to find the leak here in the region between C6 and T3. Then we recommend to use a dynamic CT myelography. This patient is placed in prone position. This is a custom made tiltable table. And we uh, perform uh, two or three scans after each other. And this technique has uh, enough uh, radiation power to find the leak and the contrast is running out in the extradural space and exactly at this point is the uh, site of leak. Type 2 accounts for about 20 or 30 percent of SIH patients and these patients have a lateral dural tear. Again the contrast is or the CSF is running out into the extra dual space. These patients are slag positive on MRI. And what we can see very often is something that looks like a um, nerve root diverticulum, but actually it is not. It is a dual tear with an arachnoid outpouching, and this pouching will rupture and there we can see the contrast running out into the extra dual um, space and this confirms the underlying uh, leak. And this is the dynamic scan. The patient is placed in lateral decubitus position in the angiography suit and the table is tilted and the um, uh, pouch is filling with contrast. And when we wait some time, we can see here the contrast running out into the extra dual space. This is another image zoomed in. And here it is better to see uh, the uh, extra dual uh, contrast in the extra dual uh, space. So the third type is the so called CCF venous fistula. This is, um, was first described in 2014. And nowadays it accounts for about 25% of SIH patients. It is hard to find these CSF venous fistulas on imaging. And here we have a direct uh, connection between, between the CSF and the paravertebral veins. Uh, um, and we have often an associated uh, nerve root diverticulum. And these patients do not have a dural tear, so they are slag negative on MRI. And here's an example. We can see um, tubular structures uh, at the paravertebral side, um, and the contrast is running here into these veins. Now this is the dynamic digital subtraction myelography. Patient is placed in lateral decubitus position and have a look at the lower left corner. Here we can see um, the contrast running into the veins. Sometimes there's a, a washing out due to not contrasted blood. And this is a very big fistula. Again, uh, on, image, on images that are not uh, subtracted, the lower left corner. And I think you can perfectly see the, the fistula running out here, the contrast running out. But there's another, um, there's another option to show these CSF venous fistulas. When you use um, CT myelography, again, the patient is uh, placed on the um, custom-made tutable table but as well, you can use, for example, a pillow under, um, under the um, hips to make the contrast run towards the head. And here's the contrast level. Patient is lying on the left uh, decubitus position and it is running out into a paravertebral vein. So in summary, 
when you are going to search for the leak, you can use a flow chart like this. Um, um, usually it is performed in specialized centers. When the patient is head positive and SLEG positive uh, at the MRI, you can either search for a type one or type two leak. Type one is uh, best to perform in DSM in uh, prawn position. Uh, when you want to find the leak in the upper thoracic, thoracic area, area, you can use a dynamic CT myelography in prone position. When you want to find a type 2 leak, you can use DSM in lateral decubitus position. And when the patient is head positive but SLEG negative on MRI, we search for a CSF venous fistula either in uh, lateral decubitus position in DSM or CTM. So, thank you very much. Excellent, Niklas. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, listen, guys, I've got, I've got lots of questions on this. I think this was one of the best bits for a, for a long time on, on any webinar because there, there's so many uh, good bits to share. Um, and may I request that when you guys are ready, if you can share conclusions and recommendations, which you think are very easy to useful and fruitful to share, we can put it on this ENS CSF section web page dedicated for this condition. And I think the radiology would be very key. And um, can I, um, first of all, ask one question, which is on behalf of um, Marek, Marek Joschnecker, our friend from Cambridge, who is one of the giants in this field of CSF, particularly London fusion studies. Um, and then I'll come back to some more questions of radiology. He's asking, can you comment on, on a role of lambda infusion test and diagnosis? I know it's not so much radiology and it may be something that you use or not. Uh, and, um, and I know Jürgen's got good views on this and, and experience. Uh, feel free to comment, uh, just short and sweet because we have lots of good questions. Please, thank you. <laughs> Maybe I can jump in because Niklas uh, doesn't do the in lumbar infusion testing. Sure. Um, this is an excellent question. And we were very enthusiastic in the beginning when we started the infusion testing as Marek Chosnika and Peter has developed, have developed. And in the beginning, we were so happy because we had a very precise instrument. And all the patients with acute SIH had very low resistance to CSF outflow. And then we recognized that over the time, and interestingly, as symptoms change, the RCSF out changes as well. So if you have chronic patients or patients where we do not know how long the disease is, um, was, was there before, the, the test is not diagnostic anymore. And even if we get patients with symptoms since years, we have well used like in normal pressure hydrocephalus. So the test, Marek, the test is excellent. We don't know how to use it. We are not able to interpret the test results in a useful clinical way. Thank you, Jürgen. I think that summarizes it beautifully, you know, in terms of its... Um... Basically, if I like to comment, it's, it's comparable to the opening pressure. And like the opening pressure normalizes over time and the, the correct right way, the, the um, comparable way, also the RCSF and the lumbar fusion test parameters, they normalize over time. It's the same thing. Absolutely. I, I found that it also, I mean, the main thing that you're saying, I suppose it's, it doesn't so much help management plan anymore because you're going to get on to other things if you're going to, and it doesn't add anything extra to diagnosis, but uh, very, very well, very good question, well made points. And um, can I just ask a very short question um, on behalf of uh, perhaps many, what's the difference between a Tardoff cyst and a lateral CSF leak on your imaging. Can you quickly expand on that? I mean, because a lot of that imaging, you pretty easily say, well, that's a tall off cyst. <laughs> and, 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 and also in, in line with that, let's say you see a lateral leak. By that time, they've got to you, they've been very symptomatic, they've sent to a special center and you see that leak and you think, oh, well, that's a lateral leak. The proof is in the, is in the eating of the, put, of the pudding. What, how can you really prove it is if you deal with that and the symptoms go away? <laughs> Do you see, I mean, let's say you find it and then 
then what? Um, the ultimate proof is we saw it, we took care of it, and the symptoms went away. Please expand on those two cheeky questions. Excuse me. I think there's only one way to prove that uh, the the cyst or the thing that is looking like a cyst is responsible for the leak, and this is uh, to to perform uh, myelography, and you can only confirm it when you see that there's a uh, contrast outflow into the epidural space. Only this is the confirmation for the CSF leak. Thank you. So you would see it on non-invasive imaging, which you've shown beautifully, and then you would have to go to a myelogram. Yes. To, to and, 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 but there is a merit in doing the non-invasive imaging because it allows you to focus on that area, I presume. Yeah, sometimes it helps uh, to focus then on this area on, on the myelogram, yes. Similar to like vascular, you know, spinal dura fistula, if you've got 31 vessels coming on each side, uh, then, you know, you do a, an MRA and then you know which vessels you have to inject on a spinal angiogram. Yeah. Um, forgive my drawing of comparisons. Jürgen, any, any extra comments on that? I mean, that was very well answered. Yeah, yeah. again, a beautiful question. And again, 90% correct, and I underline this, but there's always a gray zone in SIH. So um, I completely agree with Nicholas, and we, in the standard case, we are looking for the leaking cyst. And there is no clear cut 100% definition of what is a talof cyst, what is a menin spinal meningeal diverticulum, what is a nerve root cyst, but we are looking for the leaking cyst. You see contrast oozing out. That's, that's the target. But in desperate cases, and you know there is SIH without the proof of a leaking cyst or without the proof of a, of a ventral lateral CSF leak, and in desperate cases where we have clear orthostatic symptoms and problems, we go for hunting the biggest, most suspicious cyst and clip it. And we have a chance of improving the patient of 70 to 80%. So it's, it's the gray zone. We really have to separate the so-called easy, straightforward cases from the gray zone cases. And these gray zone cases, we always discuss interdisciplinary in a large team several times because they give us really, really uh, a hard time. But we would go for even clipping these cysts in difficult, desperate cases. Thank you for that. Um, I could ask more along that point, but I think that's very, very well answered. Um, a quick question is about the the burn scoring system. It's a bit of like chicken the egg. First of all, I mean, is it validated? And, and, and you can see why, I'm, why that question may come. Or perhaps more simply put, why pick those measurements? Why one millimeter there? Why not 1.5? Um, <laughs> um, and, and perhaps more importantly, along that, uh, for, for, for Nicholas, do you find it useful? So is it useful? Is it validated? And why those measurements? Excuse me sneaking in three questions there. <laughs> yes, I would say it's validated. I think we can ask uh, Thomas because he de developed it. And um, I think it's very useful because we really have a tool we can use. And I think this is a tool that everyone can use it in the same manner. And uh, this is very advantageous. Uh, and I think, um, yeah, we all use it here in Freiburg. And so we all uh, speak the same language and uh, about these patients. And I think this is very helpful. Yeah. Thomas, any comments? Yeah, I would, I would underline it. I mean, uh, first of all, um, the most important thing that we all are on the same page and we speak the same language. As with other scores, if you take the Spetzler Martin uh, or in stroke, if you speak, take the aspect score, are there downsides to it? Yes, of course there are. But if we say somebody has got an aspect of nine or somebody has got a Spetzler Martin five, all of us know what we're talking about, not even seeing the picture. And here also the score adds a lot in this. So when we are discussing, we know it's not perfect. There can be patients who have a very, very low score and still might be SIH patients. But this is a special group of patients which might be presenting in a very delayed manner. So this is a very good tool to triage patients. Do we want to be aggressive um, and do a more invasive workup, maybe repeat a workup, 
or do we rather uh, underline that the patient is very unlikely to have it? We will do an, a non-invasive MRI and we will not proceed with an invasive myelography, which includes contrast and also radiation. So I think it's a very good tool to triage, talk, and also design some studies because if we were talking about SIH in general, there's just a lot of uncertainties. Very well answered, guys. I mean, you know, there's no point beating about the bush. If you, if you think it's helpful, then that's it. Um, maybe we should call it Dobrovsky Lotzen score, and that will, it will take off. <laughs> <More. laughs> um, another probing question. You've said in your presentation, uh, Nicholas, that the, the type three leak is about 25% of the cases. Is that from your unit? But it, it, surely it can't be 25% of all cases of SI. Uh, no, it's um, it's from the literature, and I think um, the um, people in in USA have most experiences, I guess. But we have about twenty percent of patients with um, CSF venous fistula. Um, there are some single centers saying it might be even more than twenty five percent. Uh, but I don't know if there's a, a bias um, that they only get these patients. I think 25% um, is realistic. Yeah. Jürgen, any comments? About that? Um, it's based on the literature. It's, it's funny because uh, in the recent literature, Walter Schieving found these type of leaks 10 years ago. In the literature, older than 10 years, there is zero CSF venous fistula. So it's ever changing, huge referral bias. A couple of years ago, we had zero fistulas in Freiburg and in Bern. Now we have, like, as Nicholas said, we started with five to 10. Now we have 20%. And I think in, in, in what it Center, it's it's eighty percent, so it's huge referral bias. We have no not reliable data so far. And and is it reliable as a diagnosis that you see it as a fistula? Let's say you found it. Now, whether how you got referred is another matter. You found it, and then if you treat it, the patient gets better. Is that what happened? It is what what happens again in ninety five percent of the cases. Or put it in other words, I've never seen, or there is no single case report in the world where there's a CSF venous fistula as a normal finding. So up to now, it's pathological. The tricky issue again is, and Nicholas has published this, uh, we have patients with 12, 12, one, two, 12 CSF venous fistulas in the same patient. So it might get very tricky uh, in difficult cases, but as a bottom line, it's pathologic and close it, patient gets better. Makes me feel more and more convinced that this is a subspecialty of, it, of its own, really. Centers. But thank you. That's um, excellent. I have more questions, but I, we need to get on. Um, I'm going. To, there is another question from the audience, from an anonymous attendee. I don't want them to feel that they're being ignored. I'm saving that question after uh, Thomas's presentation and perhaps after Jürgen's. And it's about you know blood patching and and how to um, uh, treat the type three. So bear with us. Um, Welcome, Thomas, please. Thank you very much. Uh, much uh, great pleasure and honor to be invited. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, Jürgen and uh, Christian, who have previously been here in, um, in Bern and who are the luminaries in this field and who have uh, uh, made it available or, uh, to, for me to, to be part of this journey. Uh, so I will talk about the epidural blood patch, which is a very well-known technique to all of you, but maybe to give you a little bit background and uh, the thoughts when applying epidural blood patch in SIH patients. So usually what you do, you stick a needle into the epidural space and you um, inject some kind of a fluid. So um, I'm putting it in intentionally in a very vague um, way in order to, um, to talk about this topic. So well, how we usually do it, uh, under fluoroscopy guidance, you take a, take a needle, uh, inject uh, sterile blood mi mixed with some contrast, so you can really see this distribution of blood. Uh, if it's like in this case, it really nicely distributes into the lumbar and also into the thoracic spine. Forgive my interjection. Are you, are you sharing your screen? Oh, sorry. Is it not working? 
sorry, no, not the oh, right. Sorry, sorry, I apologize. No, no not the right. We, you were so good and coherent. We were mesmerized anyway, just by oh, you. No. <laughs> okay, now, now it's working. That's excellent. Yeah, okay. perfect. So this is the way it works. So that's our needle. Uh, you can see the distribution of blood in the epidural space. It's very nicely demonstrated in fluoroscopy. You can also do it by CT guidance, or you can do it blindly. So there are a lot of ways how to do it. Um, this is a, not a talk about aneurysms, but I just want to give you some perspectives and maybe uh, something for to raise some questions. If we talk about aneurysms, not all aneurysms are, are the same. They are secular, they are fusiform. We have those large ones that are comp compressing the brainstem. We have those really fusiform basilar aneurysms. We have mycotic aneurysms and we have thrombose aneurysms. So there is a lot of what is uh, being considered as being an aneurysm, but these are different animals. And for these kind of animals, we have different treatments. So there's clipping, there is balloon assisted coiling, there is stand assisted coiling. You get the point, there's a lot of um, different options how to treat aneurysms and all are being called aneurysms. Now, if we talk about intracranial hypotension, there is some kind of, it's not so evident for, uh, for us, there's a lot of um, mixing up. So spontaneous intracranial hypotension is not a post lumbar headache, uh, post a lumbar puncture headache, it's not after a surgery, it's not renal liquory. So this, these are different entities and need to be considered differently. So these are different animals and just like shown with aneurysms, there might be different uh, considerations that need to be uh, taken into account. As very nicely demonstrated by Christian, we have the orthostatic headache that is there in the acute setting, but it gets less clear as the time goes on. There's the low opening pressure, which is very, very uh, unreliable and only present in about one third of the patients. And so there's the, the imaging that we're stuck with. Um, how about the epidural blood patch? So if you look into the literature, what we did, the response rates after one epidural blood patch, it divergates that much. It's somewhere between one third to almost 90%. So how comes there's such a huge difference? Somehow it doesn't really make sense. Um, the same method, uh, why would it not work in one center and why would, would, would it work in a different center? Well, there is a lot of heterogeneity. So there is various technical aspects of epidural blood patching. There is non-uniform uh, diagnostic criteria because even if people say there is SIH, they say it because there is some kind of a headache that appears to be orthostatic. There is no proof of a leak. Uh, there is nothing. So even if people say there is SIH, there still remains some uh, confusion. Uh, and people are mixing up other pathologies to it as well. And there are not uniform clinical endpoints or imaging uh, endpoints after treatment, which make things uh, even more, uh, more difficult. So here, sometimes we're mixing apples and pears. And so just looking at the blood patch technique, so there are variations. You can inject a small amount or large amount. You can in inject different kinds of products. You can inject uh, autologous blood or you can inject fibrin. Um, you can do it targeted, as I sh did show you, with fluoroscopy or CT, or you can do it blindly. Um, so there is um, there's a lot of, lot of different techniques. And also, if you do it at the suspected level, so if you're doing it in a targeted and a non-targeted manner. So there is a lot of, lot of things that come into play, which make things a um, little bit more complicated and actually in a very uh, easy subject than we were supposed and there are different pathologies. As nicely demonstrated, there are spurs, there are nerve root diverticula, and there are CSF venous fistula. So the, the question we need to write, raise here, is the epidural blood patch going to be as effective in, in all three of those kinds? Because even though all three are gonna be called SIH, there are kind of different, right? As uh, uh, Nicholas right, uh, nicely demonstrated. So, um, I'll skip this. Uh, and the monitoring of those patients uh, varies very widely. So in the, in the literature, 
the criteria uh, that are being reformed are very subjective headache intensity. Sometimes it's a headache frequency or the duration. Um, and maybe just focusing on the headache, it's not it might not reflect a complex picture of SIH patients because, as discussed previously, those patients might have other symptoms, and there are patients that are non-orthostatic uh, headache or non-headache patients and have still SIH. So just looking at the headache as a as a parameter after a blood patch might be not be appropriate. So what is um, the mechanism? How do we think an epidural blood patch works? So we have a small tear here. Uh, we, see, uh, we see the small, uh, we see, uh, let me just put in a, a small, uh, we see the small tear here in the ventral uh, dura um, and we inject some blood and we hope that this is going to close it. Um, so what are the effects? There is a compression effect of the blood patch and there's a patch effect of the blood patch. So this is something like if you have a tear in your tire, you're going to patch it. Um, so what's the, what's the underlying mechanism of a compression effect? So you inject some blood, uh, this is going to compress the fecal sac um, and decrease the, the fecal, uh, fecal sac compliance. And you're going to push, uh, push the CSF upwards, right? So you're going to displace some, uh, some CSF and you're going to decrease uh, the compliance. And what happens, the CSF being, is being pushed upwards, and this should improve the, the clinical status of the, uh, of the patient. So if we look at it like this, the patient is lying flat. However, when he, when he elevates, usually if there, is, if there is a leak, there is a uh, CSF uh, that will, uh, that will uh, efflux into the epidural space. Uh, and this is what happens, right, if the patient uh, stands up there is an increased compliance. However, if we inject some blood into the epidural space, when the patient gets up, the, the, the compliance uh, is not as high anymore. It should be reduced because of the effect of the epidural blood, and this should, um, this should help um, uh, the patient. However, um, if we look at the blood patch, the blood in the epidural space uh, is increasingly being resorbed. So the question is, when the blood has resorbed, how is the blood patch going to work? And this is the, uh, where the patch effect comes into place. So what we believe or what the belief is that there is a form of a plug uh, around uh, the tear that forms a uh, kind of a uh, tissue that will prevent further leakage of, SF, uh, of CSF. However, uh, the likelihood of some coagulated blood to provide a stability uh, especially if you have a type 1 or type 2 leak with those first and provide a permanent sealing, in my, in my regard, it's kind of questionable. Because if we look at it with a nice illustration, we have this small spur that's penetrating the dura uh, and we inject the blood and what, what we believe that there is a fibrin plug or a, a special effect that will completely allow the dura to heal off, even though the spur is still going to be there. So this is just to um, demonstrate uh, some thoughts and uh, some mechanisms that might come into play. Um, and this is, uh, this is it as, again. Um, because if you look at those surgeries, I was happy to be present in one of them. If you see those spurs, they are like, like knives. And imagining that the blood patch will seal off that tear, even though the spur remains in place, um, in my in my point of view, kind of questionable. Um, we looked at our patients, so we have select positive patients, around 50 patients who had a proven leak, and we looked at the imaging. We called them in in 28 patients with uh, imaging, 26 still had a persistent leak, just two did not have a leak, um, and in uh, patients uh, who were referred directly to surgery uh, because they had persistent symptoms. 10, uh, 10 had uh, clear evidence of a leak. So even if we would consider that the missing uh, imaging findings that we did, did not have, the, the likelihood of a um, blood patch to provide a permanent relief or a sealing of the underlying leak in select positive patients actually is very, very low. So coming to an end, uh, it is important to remember there are three pathologies, spurs, uh, cysts and CSF venous fistulas. Maybe uh, 
uh, an individualized treatment approach according to the lead time uh, is very uh, important or warranted. Um, the epidural blood patch still remains a very, very good treatment option, which is minimally invasive, and a lot of times provides a very good immediate treatment effect. However, um, the permanent effect of the therapy remains questionable because, as I uh, demonstrated, the permanent sealing uh, of the dura remains, um, uh, remains a theory. Um, it is important in order for, for all kind of therapies in SIH pa patients to have a standardized follow-up and bring those patients back in to really see if that leak has been sealed. And if there is no improvement after blood patch, you definitely should uh, consider um, a surgery uh, or embo in CSF venous fistula. Thank you very much. Excellent, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, well, I've got lots of questions myself, but I'm going to bring in the question from our anonymous attendee um, who's been waiting for a while. And uh, the, the first part of his question or her question is, when would you proceed for surgery versus treating with a blood patch? Now, I guess you as an interventional radiologist who specialized in this, you would get asked to help many patients. When, at what stage do you get, do you get asked? Um, what are the kind of patients that refer to you for, for help? So, for blood patch. <laughs> so first of all, if you ask the patient after a blood patch, uh, two, two days afterwards and you ask him and he's still good, that doesn't mean that he, he will, uh, the leak has been sealed permanently. So I think this is the one main, main message. And uh, after looking at our numbers, uh, we uh, usually do one blood patch. However, if there is a, a symptom recurrence, we usually are um, more aggressive in sending the patients straight ahead to surgery because of the very, very high likelihood um, that uh, there's still a permanent leak. So we usually, we have stopped in patients with a proven leak uh, where there's epidural CSF, we have stopped performing three, four, five blood patches because we just see that uh, the, the treatment, the, 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 the permanent treatment, which will provide uh, permanent sealing gets delayed. And as we delay the treatment too, uh, too much, um, the, the recovery of the patient might be limited. Thank you for that. But you, you would say that you, well, we could maybe at the end of the presentation to agree when you do do a blood patch in terms of criteria. Um, Jürgen will know what I mean because we've talked about this before in terms of who gets a blood patch. Let me put it another way. It's so common, um, certainly when I was a trainee many years ago, um, especially this diagnosis became more recognized, to have a patient with a diagnosis based on image finding and the symptoms. And sadly, you would see these patients have a blood patch, quite often respond well and they get discharged, and you wouldn't know what happened to them. Now, I thought maybe they would respond well if they just have bed rest for a couple of weeks more and drink lots of tea or coffee. Uh, the thing is, it wasn't really graded. It was kind of, well, try this because it's so low risk and see if it gets better, if the patient gets better. And I always wondered, how does a blood patch work? And your slides seem to be very helpful. So question along those lines is, how do you know how much rise you get in the blood patch? How many levels does it go up? Because uh, surely that's relevant. Any data on that and any teaching and guidance on that in terms of how many levels from your injection site and how do you choose your injection site? So we usually perform a um, non-targeted lum lumbar blood patch. So we usually inject at the lever of the lumbar spine and the amount of the blood is, um, is given by how much the, uh, the patient is able to tolerate. So it's usually sometimes around 20 20 to 40, some people support it better, some, some, some uh, cannot, um, uh, cannot tolerate as much. Um, but when you do the fluoroscopy during the injection, you can see the distribution of the blood uh, up into the thoracic spine. If you have the patient in lateral decubitus, you can nicely see uh, that there is a distribution. And after the blood patch, what we usually do uh, when the patient gets transferred to the bed, we usually tilt the bed, we have tiltable beds, 
uh, we, we tilt the bed uh, head down. So there is um, this favors the distribution of the blood higher up into the thoracic spine if the leakage is uh, suspected at that level. Uh, so that's uh, that's how we usually perform it. No, that's great, Thomas. Do you know how many, I mean, can you give an, an idea how many, what's the sort of maximum levels you think you can get up? Is there any, I know I'm being too fixated. Yeah, but there are studies that are, there have been previous studies in the 90s who did MRI scans in those patients. And you can see the distribution of blood up, up into the uh, upper thoracic spine, B, uh, T1, wow. T2. Um, however, this is some question I would like to ask uh, our surgeons, Jürgen and uh, Christian. Uh, if you do a surgery two, three weeks after a blood patch, how many times did you see blood in the epidural space? Well put, thank you. We do not, I do support your your nice presentation, the, the, the change of compliance. I think that's very logical. And that's also our result that almost all patients um, improve after blood patch, probably temporarily. And we barely see blood in surgery at the time of surgery. And I personally have never seen a plug that has formed right at the level of the dural tear. So the plug theory, I think, is, is out from my perspective. The compliance theory is very valid. Thank you, Tim. That was, um, there's so many questions around this, but I think we've learned a lot there. Um, a, 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 another one for you, Thomas, is that is the second part of our um, anonymous attendees question is, how do you treat a type three, meaning the CSF venous fistula? And would that raise a window of opportunity, a way to treat benign intracranial hypertension? Um, and I think you've put a dash of an iatrogenic creation of such a fistula, just a thought. Um, that's <laughs> so from, I, from, I like my, from my understanding in CSF venous fistula, if we inject blood into the epidural compartment, this might um, lead to some kind of a compression, but we are not going to seal off that fistula. So um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, patch is very unlikely pr to provide any kind of um, permanent uh, sealing of a CSF venous fistula. Um, and coming to the, to the other part of the question um, um, is, do we think that patient, is that the way I understand it? If patients with a CSF venous fistula are patients with previous uh, hypertension who have formed a fistula to cure themselves. So is that the theory behind it? Uh, we don't know. Yeah, but, uh, it, it, absolutely. I mean, really, you could say that's why the the ethos and the hypothesis behind uh, putting stents and shunts for hydrocephalus from CSF into the venous uh, system, which works. Um, it's, it's having a bit more resurgence, but um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good hypothesis, but I don't think it'd be a, a good treatment plan at the moment. Um, although CVs have lumbar punctures that work for IRH on the same principle. Um, Thank you very much, Thomas. That was really, really good um, and um, very, very uh, thought provoking. Um, thank you. May I welcome Professor Jürgen Beck. Um, so thank you very much, Jürgen. Uh, we're really looking forward to the, um, your talk and uh, please continue. Thank you. We can see, that's excellent, thank you. And now you can hear me as well. Yes. So Mansur, thanks again for putting this excellent webinar together. I would like to share you at the end the uh, basics of treatment, basic of surgical treatment, and probably some new perspective for this uh, fascinating disease. So Christian, Nicholas, and Thomas, they were very humble and said, please consider SIH in these patients. This is a prototypical image. I would put it further and say, tell me a valid differential diagnosis in a patient with this kind of image and a GCS of 15 that is completely symptom-free while lying down. Name me one differential diagnosis. This is just CSF lead. In a patient that has no complaints while lying down. This is not MPEMA. This is not basal carcinoma, meningiomatosis in a completely symptom-free patient. 
So remember that it's really, you need to search the leak in these patients. Concerning uh, bed rest and uh, supportive medication and blood patching, we are getting more and more aggressive with only following a very short period of bed rest, meaning two, three days, and then proceed with the next blood patch. And then depending on what, what Thomas very nicely separated these major three types of leaks, what type of leak you have, if you have a ventral leak with a microspur, um, we stop after one or two blood patches and proceed with surgery. There's a huge referral bias in our center, probably every fifth or every fourth patient gets um, surgery. So um, again, only valid for 95% of cases, this, this three types are responsible for 90, 95% of, of leaks. There are some more exotic type of leaks or uh, but as a start, we can differentiate type 1 ventral leaks, type 2 lateral leaks, and type 3 CSF venous fistula, as has nicely been shown. For surgical treatment, let's start with the type 1 fistulas, the microspurs. Um, we need to get to the ventral side of the dura. And um, we, we started this doing with an open approach and burn under neuromonitoring. monitoring. The, the key step was always cutting the dentate ligament and really, really decently rotating the spinal cord and then you have access to the ventral side, remove the spur and suture the ventral tail. These days we, we switch to a more minimal invasive approach. So we use this only uh, one inch or 2.5 centimeter skin incision and uh, insert this uh, 20 millimeter um, tubular retractor, adjust the fenestration, only make a tiny little hole in the lamina. And to show you how this looks like, just a short surgical video. This is not a prototypical patient. She has a BMI of, of 40. Usually these patients are thin and tall. So you barely need an eight centimeter tubular retractor at the cervical spine, but it's still doable. And then you insert the tubular retractor um, under fluoroscopy, you insert the microscope, and then you can access dura is opened dentate ligament is cut, you have access to the ventral side of the dura and find this always very similar looking oval shaped two to four centimeter, uh, millimeter long dural tears. Systematically, you insert the tube under fluoroscopy, you open the dura in the lateral way, you cut the dentate ligament, which is a key step. So once again, this key step, the dentate looks always the same, a very tiny, tiny little membrane, open the dura, to the tubular retractor on the lateral side and identify dentate. Here is a dentate, tiny little band, cut it, and then you can proceed on the lateral side on the dura to the ventral side and find this small two to three millimeter long oval shaped dual tear. Don't push the spinal cord aside. Only go on the lateral side of the dura and force the dura to your side, never put on the spinal cord, of course. In most instances, this will suffice to, to remove the tiny little microspur, which is not so much a knife, it just, it functions like the constant movement. It functions like a knife, it's more like a little smaller than a corn of rice and it's, it's opening the dura. Then we do it on both sides, open the extra thickle space and put a small patch. We use these tyrosine patches underneath, pull it into the dural tear and secure it in a sandwich type fashion with an interdural um, patch. And that's, that's enough. You don't need to suture the dura on the ventral side. It's usually um, not suturable very well. So you don't have to handle a, a needle underneath the spinal cord. So patching is really sufficient. And then again, how this looks like, open the dura in the dorsolateral fashion, move along the dura to the ventral side, and then you identify the leak. You remove this tiny microspur, which is very, very tiny, um, not so much like a knife. It's more the, the constant pressure and movement. Remove it, and then you can uh, insert the patch, no suturing at all, um, from the extradural side. Pull it a little bit into the tear, like here, pull it into the tear, and then um, secure it with a patch from the interdural side, one little droplet of fibrin glue, and you're done. And this is really the, 
very small fashioned uh, tailored approach only this there is not even the facets are, are spared there is no pedicle drilling there is just a tiny little opening that's enough and to give you some numbers this is another case where you see this oval shaped chair in the ventral side of the dura they all look the same it's we did a dural opening of from here to here which is like eight millimeters and no suturing very straightforward very simple technique key key step is not to pull the spinal cord away just to pull the dura to your side to identify the leak um, lateral leaks or leaking cyst meningeal diverticulums it's the key step is i think to understand that uh, the agens is the tear in the dura here is the oozing out of the csf and the cyst is just the, the tendency of the body to heal this leak it's just an outpouched uh, arachnoid membrane and you can see this if you this is a, a case done from burn we did a larger opening and you have this scary looking cyst here is the, the root and here is the thickle sac and if you operate this early on a couple of weeks after symptom onset you see um, Christian already has shown this image. You see this translucent type of membrane, which is nothing but the arachnoid pouching out, and the CSF is oozing underneath these cysts. And if you operate this after a couple of weeks or months, there's a little scarring, and you see it's uh, not translucent anymore, but it's the same principle, just it, scarring occurred. And here's a thickle sac, here's a, the rootlet, and here's underneath is a dural tear, and this is just the tendency of the body to seal the leak um, with this outpouched arachnoid membrane. To, to visualize it further with a short, another short surgical video. This is this tip, prototypical type two lateral leaking cyst and um, exactly visualize and uh, localize the very exact spot on the spinal cord, in the spinal column. You do a small fenestration, tailored fenestration um, remove these neomembranes, expose the cyst by going a little bit more laterally where the root exits. And now you have, you see the top of the cyst, and now you identify the cyst. And again, this is a, a still now, you see uh, the thetal sac, you see the exiting root, and here in the shoulder of the exiting nerve root, there is a tear in the dura, and this cyst is just the yeah, outpouched arachnoid probably. I continue with the movie at this stage. Um, here is the rootlet and this is the cyst that is, has been detected on imaging. You can identify your anatomy, you reduce the cyst, you, you push it just back into the, into the root. And if it is a, a non-eloquent root, we are on the, uh, on the side to be very, humble and secure. And I think this is not enough, it might reopen. So we form a kind of a cola allow around the root, secure it with, uh, this is again, uh, Duragen and Tachosil and clip the root it's in a non-eloquent case, like in a thoracic root. And then the patient was symptom free. Um, then there are these very interesting and fancy CSF venous fistulas and Walter Schiebing, who else? discovered them um, not even 10 years ago. And we had a hard time finding these CSF venous fistulas. You need some certain neurological tips and tricks to find this as Nicholas has nicely shown. And currently I think we have around 20% of all SIH patients present the CSF venous fistulas in our, in our case here. So now this, there's of course a referral bias. This is another image from Walter's publication in New England Journal of Medicine. You see here, there is this CSF venous fistula where there is probably CSF in these uh, compartments in this space and then the vein forms and drains the CSF into the, um, the, the venous system. Again, does this really exist? Uh, and how does this look like during surgery? A sh short surgical video from a recent case and very nicely depicted CSF venous fistula by Niklas Litzen and um, Horst Urbach. And then we can go to the OR, we exactly know where the leak is. And um, then we can, again, use this small incision, use a tubular retractor, 
uh, tailor our small fenestration, um, have access to the dura, and then you have this epidural space and there is nothing but wings. So how can you tell this is a CSF venous fistula? You never know, there are so many epidural wings. So we inserted a lumbar drain just before surgery, injected sodium fluorescein, and we're looking for what's happening. Do we really have a channel that is connecting the thickal space with the venous system? And after two minutes, the root is slowly filling and then the vein fills up. And only this vein fills up, this very specific vein and all the other veins that are present in the epidural space didn't show up, didn't fill. And then we coagulated this very specific vein, found a kind of a fistula point here, which was, a, uh, was the connection of the thecal sac to the vein. And because we were very um, humble and anxious that we, we, we got all of these CSF fistulas, we clipped, we made a cola around the, the rootlet and clipped it and patient did well. What do you do? This is an image of this very specific vein and all the other veins did not show up signs of sodium fluorescence filling. So it was a very specific singular uh, channel. This is very fascinating, I think. What do you do with eloquent uh, roots? You can't clip. This is, for instance, a patient with an, I think, L2 um, um, uh, leaking cyst. What do you do in these cases? Again, this is the thecal sac, this is cranial, this is cauda. You have here the, the root and you see there is somewhere here or here is a tear on the dura and this arachnoid is pouching out. And, but you cannot sacrifice an L2 root. So we reduce the cyst and it suddenly collapses and then you can form a small layer of this uh, formerly arachnoid membrane and wrap it around the root. Then you uh, form a second layer with some Dura substitute material like Dura, dura again, then we made a second layer with a more uh, firm material that we put into a collar and put it under some, some tension and uh, did a fixation with an aneurysm clip that we have just, you can adjust the, the strength of the tension and put in some rolled material so that it forms like a spring to really, to really uh, augment the Dura and this patient did fine and the root was intact and no neural deficit. Of course, we have a neurovascular disease. We can approach these CSF venous fistulas, as uh, Wolek Benjiki has nicely shown, um, transvenously. There's a very beautiful anatomy as well. There's always this little ring of veins around the exiting nerve root. And you know, here's the nerve root exiting. And as again, as Niklas and Horst are doing these elegant onyx embolizations, which works very well um, again. So it's not only a spinal disease, it's only a prototype of a neurovascular disease. Very interesting again. What is new, what I really want to point you at is um, again, the, the question of timing and when and what to treat. And uh, Christian has shown us that it's a dangerous disease, but it's not only a dangerous disease concerning, um, concerning um, that the patient can die, but concerning that they, the patients lose their lives, they lose their jobs, they lose their families. And look at uh, the time span of duration of sick leave. Um, three quarters of the patients had a sick leave uh, of three months to, to, to over one year, and it had all moderate or severe and over half of the patients impact on their partnership, on their health status, and on their social activities. So it is not a benign disease. And we uh, by Marek Chosnes' car infusion test, we found some arbitra arbitrary um, thresholds between 10 weeks, uh, less than one year, and over one, and over one year. There were changes, really physical changes in the patient going on. This changed the RCSF out. We still do not know why this happens and what's going on on a pathophysiological basis. But we know, and we looked at all, all other features. Is it a high flow leak? And what level is the leak? Nothing really was associated with outcome, but one thing, one thing that was associated with better outcome was early treatment. So early treatment was of a very, very high prognostic significance concerning good outcome for our patients. So this is probably a very important slide. This is just uh, experience based from, from uh, Bern and Freiburg and to try to give you numbers. This is not level one evidence. There is no prospective study at all, but 
we want to leave you with just do it early. We want to give you some numbers. And this is just experience based. So um, again, SIH is not a benign disease. Uh, it should, patients should be seen by a neurologist early on, and then they, sh they should decide to do an MRI. If it is more a thunderclap headache, of course, as an over an emergent basis, if it is severe orthostatic headache, still continue the MRI in the first days, then only make a very, very short conservative period and start epidural blood patching after one week, just to give a number. In the first week, a patient should get an epidural blood patch. Repeat the blood patch after two or three weeks. And if you, if a patient uh, um, still has symptoms, you should transfer the patient to a specialist neurocenter, not meaning that uh, patients should only be treated in, in our centers, but in centers where there is, what is a specialist neurocenter? I think basically it's the neuroradiologist where you have this very fancy, very elaborate neuroradiology workup where you can find patients lying head down, lateral decubitus, um, breathing through, through a straw to find these CSF um, venous fistulas, for instance, because, because imaging to find the leak is invasive and is associated with a lot, a lot of uh, radiation issues. So, um, but you should start this in the first four weeks that we can go on the surgery or endovascular embolization in the first three months because our experience is that after three months, patients have a worse outcome. This is just a suggestion from our group what the timeline could roughly be. Again, of course, thanks to our team and some, some questions um, or some daily problems we face. Um, we had the issue that patients get better with blood patching, probably some are really good, then they present to you at follow up and you have still um, extra CTCSF. What do you do? And our experience is, is don't stop, so continue with uh, treatment. And this is a pathological state um, there should be no CSF in a healthy patient, and it's not healthy in the long run because of what? what? Because we have not only acute sequelae of a CSF venous fistula, which is spontaneous intracranial hypotension or subdural We also have chronic states of um, these spinal dural leaks, and there is clearly a sub, um, very excellent work done by Kumar from the Mayo Clinic that superficial siderosis, typical infratentorial superficial siderosis is most likely probably to spinal dual CSF leads. So, and in a recent publication, this is a, an image with uh, uh, intratentorial siderosis. You might even point to a CSF marker. Um, ferritin is promising, these are preliminary data, but probably we can detect and follow our patients with um, a marker in the CSF to, to follow these patients. Um, with siderosis or before they have siderosis. Any other fancy stuff? We did a lot of work with uh, finding or um, diagnosing patients with ultrasound. This hasn't turned out to be useful in the daily practice. The interrater variability is just too large. So we have skipped this as a screening test. It's still useful uh, when we do a follow-up, but we have a very fancy paper done by, by Dr. Wall from Neurology um, using scene flow at the spinal cord at the level of C1 and C2, and she has really gotten fascinating results. Just to give you one instance, we had a case with a leak in the, um, in the scene in motion MRI, uh, clearly showing us that there is a leak. After surgery, patient was healed, patient um, um, had a, re uh, a relapse, uh, a real relapse, so the, the leak reopened, it was clearly demonstrated by the scene in motion, we did a second surgery and the scene motion MRI was normal again. So a very promising tool, non-invasive without any contrast. There is another tool we, we are trying to establish, which is gallium CSF pad. And the very important message here is that it's not useful at all for finding the leak site, but it's probably a tool for the very tough patients where you have a high suspicion for having a CSF leak but you don't know whether you should apply another round of neuroradiology workup with a lot of radiation. And if you have two signs, you have a, a, a half-life of the gallium um, less than seven hours, you know there is a leak, or if larger than seven hours, you are quite sure there is no leak. And if you have 
look at these gamma images or PET images if there is um, no, no activity over the hemispheres, you have a high likelihood of having a CSF leak. And if there is um, activity over the hemispheres, you have no leak. So you can discriminate patients that deserve further invasive work, work up from patients that don't need further invasive work, up, not for finding the leak. And as Manzo uh, already mentioned, there is still the gray zone of these 10 or 15% of patients where we all don't know what to do with. And probably it's enough for patients having a kind of a slack dura or probably several, and patients do have several of these spinal meningeal um, diverticular or nerve root cysts. And they may even be non-leaking cysts, but it may suffice that the com um, compliance of the fecal sac is, is increased to, to an extent that the patient has symptoms while standing up. And this is an entity, we don't know whether it really exists or not, but it's a very interesting and intriguing concept. And what we found or what Christian found today before yesterday is a publication from 1918 in Chama, which is uh, a, a new group of patients that we are uh, very concerned to see more and more often on a daily basis already these days which is a uh, postural puncture headache and not only postural puncture headache, but chronic postural puncture headache. And imagine in 1918, there was no MRI, there was no microscope. Russell McRobert hypothesized that uh, most patients don't get any headache after lumbar puncture because the arachnoid, the hole in the arachnoid and the hole in the dura are not in the same spot when you reduce the needle. It's also fluid and flexible. And in a very rare case, when the needle tears out the arachnoid, out of the dura, like in these cysts I've shown you, there might be the rare instance of uh, postural puncture headaches. And um, this is even an entity that is, I, I think, a little bit neglected as was H SIH a couple of years ago. And we just to give you an impression, we summarized the last 70 patients that presented to Freiburg with chronic postural puncture headache. We had a follow-up by questionnaire from over 30 patients. And these 30 patients, look at these numbers, had over one year of sick leave, um, contacted at least five doctors or hospitals, and have been at least one month, 31 days in acute hospital care after one lumbar puncture. So we don't know what's going on in these patients, but this is still to add on another enigmatic um, sub-entity of this Interviewing disease. But there's, um, I think there's no doubt that as in the first days when we handle these patients that this disease exists. You see there are two reviews, one by Walter Schieving in the New England Med Journal of Medicine and a couple of weeks later one in the Lancet, all about SIH and finding the leak. And there are many, many um, meetings popping up. The, the one I, I'm aware of is an excellent meeting in Naples in a couple of weeks, and there is a beautiful meeting, meeting by Walter Schieving in Hawaii and during summertime. And as Christian, Thomas, and Niklas already mentioned, we also do or try to do a meeting with uh, even with life surgery. And we have, I think, Mansur, we are lucky to, to get you also to the meeting and your colleagues from, from England to have a little discussion over, over three days to further our knowledge about this disease. To summarize it, to give you some points, avoid Chronification, consider SIH as a dangerous disease. Um, a blood patch on the, on the other side is uh, not dangerous. And if blood patching fails, surgery or embolization is the treatment of choice. Treat early, don't wait is an important message. And some points may be provocative for discussion. What not to do, you should not rely on opening pressure you should not do any more non-dynamic studies like a CT myelography with a huge radiation dose, and you will never find the leak with a plain CT myelography. Scintigraphy also is not uh, should not be done for localizing the leak, only for knowing whether you should proceed with invasive neurological studies or not. Don't explore over several levels if you don't know where the site of the leak is. You will never find this. And also, don't stop after one unsuccessful blood patch. Don't stop after some improvement. The goal is to get these patients back to their normal life again. This is at least the goal. And don't stop when the patient is still positive um, with slacks on the, on the spinal MRI. And 
Um, on the other hand, if you have a chronic patient, don't be naive and think if you close the leak via embolization or by surgery that the symptoms are all gone the next day. It takes a lot of time for that. So consider SAH in your, in your workup. Remember, there is no real differential diagnosis in such a patient and uh, do epidural blood patching early and consider a new specialist neuroscience center for this invasive imaging. And again, to give you some numbers, uh, blood patch should be done in the first seven days and a special workup should be done in the first month. So thank you very much for the EANS. Um, Mansoor and, and uh, his colleagues uh, managed to, to build now a real section. This is so helpful for our adventure and we are so grateful that we can give this um, the second uh, ENS webinar and then we can join with more webinars and more meetings and then we can join our efforts for this fascinating season. Thank you very much. Excellent, Jürgen. Um, as always, really, it was a superb uh, presentation by all the team and a superb way to sort of end with that brilliant summary. Uh, a lot of questions, but they seem to get answered as we went along. Um, and I just wonder, Jürgen, to begin with, if the, if the article from JAMA, if many of those patients had a subdural collection, um, but no one could see it on a scan um, in 1918. <laughs> but but it's, it's, it's a very valid uh, question that you raised with that, with that, um, with that old paper. Um, before we ask some pertinent ones, which may be provocative, we've got a couple that from the audience. One uh, from um, Mandu Sala. Have you ever seen any spondylolysis as an underlying cause of type 2 CSF leakage? Uh, that then comes, I think it's very specific. Um, so whether you, you've encountered that. No, I haven't seen this as an underlying cause. No single case so far. So um, Mambu, if you've got one, there's a case report for you. So. <laughs> um, the next question from Andes Golgen is, do you include examination of where um, the artery of the dam skillage is located, basically before doing surgery? Um, no, we don't do that. And if the surgery uh, went, is, is, is going smoothly, we don't have to cut any artery. We go on the lateral aspect of the, of the dura and do not encounter the artery that is exiting via the nerve root. So we don't look for it and we never had a complication luckily, uh, Judith Adam Kivitz. Ah, great, excellent. Along those lines, to begin with then, do you use intraoperative monitoring when you do this? We did this in the first 100 cases and we um, skipped it after we switched to a minimal invasive approach, but um, I cannot recommend this as a general rule. I was very humble and started with uh, using extensive neuromonitoring over with gathering more and more experience, we, we skip this, um, but it's a valid tool, of course. Sure. So, um, and really the whole team can contribute, but I, I think with all the stuff that's been uh, put, it seems to me you've got a superb setup, like some rare centers around the world. You know, if you've got excellent new radiology, they tell you where the leak is, they present it, with clear, good history, they've been diverted to your unit. May I suggest a lot of the work has been, how should I say, done to make, by the time the patients come to you, they are very likely to require surgery uh, and or, or extra treatment. And the way you've um, you know, located uh, the leak is, is excellent. Then it, it looks like so smooth and such a dream, you know, put in a, 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 a small cylinder for the for the, for the surgery and, and, and seal it. My question to you to begin with is, do you think this pathology should be treated in specialized centers in, in a particular health system? Because neurosurgical colleagues and neurologists do see this condition. The prevalence is perhaps far more than you know, five or eight per 100,000. Vast majority may settle down with conservative management. What are your thoughts about that? And, and please feel free not to be shy. This is more about what's, what's going on with this condition. Excellent question. I'm, I think they should be treated in specialized centers. 
And um, two points. The, the most important issue is that uh, finding the league is really difficult. And from our experience, we, by chance, we get a lot of patients from, from, from abroad and from all over Germany. And many of these have been operated on before and just extensive approaches, several level uh, corbectomies from anterior approaches. And it was not so often a surgical problem. It was just a problem. Surgery was excellent, but the leak was the different side. And um, neurology, with a lot of experience, pointed us to the proper side, to the real side of the leak, and surgery was easy then. And But I'm not saying um, that we have enough centers. We clearly, and this is what I think this webinar is all about, and all the uh, EANS efforts are about. We need to build more centers. We need to spread this, this knowledge because there are so many patients um, under, undiagnosed, underdiagnosed, and not, not uh, treated so smoothly as when Niklas does the, or Thomas is, is doing the, the neurology workup. So we need to spread this knowledge. And that's why we're doing webinars. That's why we are putting up our, our meeting with trying to, to do live surgeries and stuff. I think there's a huge demand for it. But just starting with the first patient and uh, do the first surgery is probably probably difficult. And we've seen many, many patients with uh, extensive surgery but just at the wrong level. Well, thank you for that. I mean, thinking about my own country in the UK, I can, because of the interest in new radiology being so key, um, and size of units being important, you can see only that happening in, you know, and maybe perhaps no more than 10 centers. Um, and it would make sense. Now, what about, historically speaking, what happened, do you think, to those patients in the past decades that didn't get diagnosed? Because, and I, and I, I, I put this in a sense that the natural, what is the natural history of this condition? If they don't receive treatment. And I put to you the, the, the comments we get from neurology colleagues and from self reflection one long time ago. Well, patients didn't turn up, God forbid, in, in AE departments dead. Well, that could be defined from by this, God forbid. Maybe there are, and I'm, and I'm sure there are rare cases where patients, God forbid, succumb to it. But what do you think happened? Um, to these patients in health systems, in modern health systems in, in Little Europe, until recent uh, awareness? Yeah, I think most of the patients get better over time, maybe probably to the blood patch or just by healing themselves, but they hardly, the, the, the majority hardly gets back to their normal lives. And when we look at our patients, where symptoms started over several years, they all have some kind of pseudo-psychiatric diagnosis, burnout or depression, they have a lot of medication and they functioning more or less, but they don't function at the level they could function. So I think there is a, a tremendous subgroup of patients out with uh, undiagnosed chronic SIH still. And also, if I may add, there is a lot of uh, clinical settings where untreated, um, untreated SIH might lead to very severe disability, like the pictures you were showing of superficial siderosis. These are some dramatical stories, patients who have not been treated. And this was, uh, uh, we didn't know why people uh, had superficial siderosis. We did uh, angiograms, cerebral angiograms, looking for aneurysms, looking for dural AV fistulas. And coming back and looking into the history, we have found one, two or three patients where you can actually see the reason for the siderosis is, is a underlying leak. So also there is more and more things that come into our attention uh, where superficial, um, where intracranial hypotension might, might lead to disastrous outcome in the long term, although it's considered a benign disease. Thank you. Um, uh, excellent team. Thank you. Um, it, it's just for me. There's um, it, it's it's sometimes hard to accept. Patients have suffered for so long with certain diagnosis, and only recently we've we figured out what to do for them. 
Um, but it may be, do you think this condition is something similar to, let's say, uh, lots of different severities of Chiari malformation, where patients are suffering for years, some for decades, and eventually learn to live with it because it doesn't do severe harm. Um, they have, you know, the tussive headaches, the, the cranial nerve symptoms, they may not develop a syrinx or a, 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 any other problems, but they just learn to live with it and maybe just tip over back into equilibrium or with brain shrinkage and so on. I, I wonder if it is that the majority still somehow uh, accommodate that leak, uh, in which case maybe we don't need to operate on them. But I appreciate you get the creme de la creme, you get the worst cases. And, and looking at your series and listening to you and reading around and meeting many of these patients, it sounds like so, you know, intervention is the better option, isn't it? Surely, if, if you've got such severity of symptoms and a proven leak, and what, 90% um, cure rate with, with operation? Is that what I'm hearing from uh, whether it's type two or type three? I mean, what is the success rate with, with surgery? And what would you say is the complication rate with, with surgery for the type twos and type threes or, or type one? And it, it, sorry to put you on the spot. Any comments about outcomes and risks? And unfortunately, there is no simple answer. The cure rate concerning the leak is over 90% with embolization and with surgery when we find type two, type one, type three leaks. But this doesn't correspond to um, such a high level in clinical cure rate. And this really this, um, um, corresponds with the timing of symptoms. And if it is only less than three months, they all get, get well. If it's longer than three months, they have a hard time and we still have no clear predictor who will be back on the, on the pre-symptomatic level and who will still suffer some kind of symptoms. And to be honest, we don't know why, because I mean, it's a, a surgical case. You have a tear in the dura, you see it, you close it, and still the patient is better, but not symptom-free. Why? What's going on? I don't know. There's a lot. The more we know about this disease, the more questions are, are opening. If I, I'd like to comment. Uh, I mean, you have to be more distinctive when you talk about outcome in SAH. Because you not only have to look at headache, you have to look at, at depression, at fatigue, at, at all this, this wide aspect of problems these patients are facing. And we know that these patients and the different aspects, and they're all together in one patient, always to a certain degree. And we know that this develops differently depending on severity preoperatively and pretreatment. So you cannot say, okay, we have, um, you cannot only say we have no headaches anymore. There's a you need to you have a look at the depression. You have to look at, at fatigue and all this stuff. And this behaves differently in these two patients. So it's very complex to assess outcome in SAH patients. Sure. It, it, you know, if you talk about psychological symptoms following long history of pain and discomfort, you can imagine the impact. And then you, you take away the condition in terms of a surgical cure. You can certainly appreciate, we can all appreciate how the patients would continue to be symptomatic following such a long history. But it can also be a self fulfilling prophecy if you get, um, the, if you look at the cases which have been symptomatic for a long time, haven't settled down conservatively, have been to other units. And by the, so therefore, by definition, they would be the worst cases by the time they come to you. Maybe that's why they don't. Um, uh, have the you know as as cure, uh, strong cure rates, but are you convinced that the earlier you detect, the sooner you treat, the better the outcome? I am I am convinced by that, but of course you are right. We can only answer this question, and this is an excellent question, by forming new centers, doing prospective studies with independent outcome assessment by neurologists. Of course, we must do this. From my experience, I'm convinced that all these patients um, get better by this by specific treatment. And really there's a strong dependency, the earlier, the better. And we have patients that refuse surgery or endovascular treatment in, in the first run. And when we have a type one, type two or type three leak identified, they all come back. They all come back and ask for treatment. But still to answer the question, definitely we need prospective studies together with neurology in big centers.
Um, excellent. Tim, just before we, we go, because we could do this for longer, it's, it's been um, a, a really good long show and fantastic. Uh, one more question from um, Mamudo Sala. Have you ever kept a lumber drain post-operatively? And if so, for how long? I, I, I guess the answer to that is no, yes. <laughs> no, we don't use lumber drains post-operatively, not at all. Thank you. Um, so, Tim, a huge thank you again to you. Um, fantastic as always. I think it's worthwhile for anyone to, to re-watch, to watch again this webinar or go to certain sections regarding recommendations. But it would be very uh, valuable to allocate a web page for this condition with your um, summaries and some recommendations and to catch up again uh, with, with further catch up webinars on this and aspects of this condition. And I invite also the audience uh, and all those who are tuning in once again to attend and come to Fiverr uh, beginning or even earlier than 30th of March. And you're treated to, I think, some live surgery sessions to begin with, which is, should be fantastic and to some excellent talk for some superb colleagues who are, who, who humble you, um, especially in, including from, from UK and from other parts of the world. Um, so with that, a huge thank you once again to you. Um, uh, thank you, Christian. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you, Thomas. And um, thank you, um, Jürgen. Brilliant, really, really, really good uh, session. Um, and um, we hope you come back and do some more for us. Thank you, Manzu. God bless you, team. Thanks. 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 It was a pleasure. Take care. Bye-bye.